it's like an entire cosmos by the time they get to the end. And the journey you'll go on will just be incredible. Hello and welcome to episode one of the Music King podcast. I'm your host, Trinity Lay, and today we are joined by performer, teacher, and lifelong student, Jim Feist. With him, we'll be exploring the art of the tabla, a two-piece South Asian hand drum used as a principal percussive instrument in Hindustani, also known as North Indian classical music. It utilizes a wide range of finger and palm techniques to produce a variety of sounds, and these sounds have all been adapted into mnemonic syllables, allowing tabla maestros to recite, learn, compose, and improvise in an artistic merging of poetry and rhythm. Professor Feist has spent the greater portion of his lifetime studying the tabla, having had the good fortune of learning from many great stalwarts, including Ustad Alaraka, Pandit Yogesh Samsi, Sukhwinder Singh Namdhari, and Pandit Samir Chatterji, to name a few. Incidentally, he also happens to be my own tabla teacher, and having the opportunity to learn from him has been one of the highlights of my time here at CCM. For my listeners at UC, be sure to check out his class. Look for Tabla 1 under class code MUHS6085. It's completely free, and you can take it for zero credits, and you get your own set of Tabla to take home and practice. It's a really great time, you meet some really cool people, and uh, be sure to check it out if you have the chance. One of my favorite things about the tabla that I've really enjoyed the last about year or so that I've been practicing it is that you can recite everything that you can play. And so it's nice to just be able to walk around and almost practice without the instrument when you don't have access to it and just recite your compositions and the things that your teacher has given you. So what's the reciting aspect of it and what are the bowls? Yeah, so yeah, exactly like you said, they're called bowls. And bowl literally means to speak in the Hindi language. Your Mother would say, if you did something wrong, she'll say, El bolna, like, tell me what you did wrong. So bol in a, in a tabla sense are the notes that we recite. And that's how we learn the instrument. That's how, just like you said, you're able to pass on compositions. That's how you're able to improvise on compositions, remember compositions, is through this the speech aspect of this. This is na. And this is a bigger drum. I'll be playing a smaller drum later in the podcast, so you can hear sort of the contrasting qualities of a larger drum versus a smaller one. That was na. This is surta, or closed tin. It's a little more shimmering. So the difference between na and tin, first na, then tin. Subtle, but beautiful. Then open tin, or tun. Tita, which is a closed sound, or consonant sound we call. All those ones before were vowel sounds. Tita. Tira. Tak. Dhinna. And that basically covers the right hand. The left hand drum, which is bigger than the right hand, and it's made of some sort of metal or steel or copper, where the right one's made of wood, almost exclusively. This has essentially two sounds, a closed sound, which is any K sound, K, ki, and then the open sound, which is called G, G-H-E, or G, or Git, or G, G, G. So then when you combine them, like when you put two different colors together, you get another color. Same with this. So Na plus G equals ta. Tin plus ge equals din. T plus ge is det. We make compositions from this, and compositions have been passed down for 100, 150 years using this system, which is cool because you don't really have to write the stuff down, but it's not cool and how many things probably got lost. But... When you have to learn it, like in this way, you actually pay attention more when you're learning it than if your teacher just says, this is what it is, and you write it down. You're not even really learning it. You're just writing it down. And then later on, maybe you'll learn it. But if you learn it in front of your teacher this way, 
it's more likely to stick in your head. And just a f- couple phrases, maybe mm-hmm. how we how we make this into essentially rhythmic poetry. So we take all of these things, and this is just a few phrases, and we make long, beautiful, rhythmic poetry, essentially. I really teach the musicality of it through the speech part of it. It's hard to teach that on drums, but when I do the bari and kali, I do that, uh, you know, the essential, or the going up in pitch, for example... So basically, what was that? That was a taka 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 taka. It was just going on, right? Just eighth notes or whatever. Through the language is where it becomes music. And could you explain what Kali is? Yeah, so the part where I got sort of high in my voice and a little lighter, that was where the Kali is observed. Kali means empty, um, again in Hindi. So Kali represents the portion of the rhythmic cycle that is unaccented. Normally it's halfway through, and it's just a thread that runs through every single North Indian classical concert that I don't know that's in any other music. Everything's sort of a cycle, and there's that cycle of coming to the Kali, and then back to the sum, then back to the Kali, then back to the sum, and as this is, this is going on the entire performance. Mm-hmm. And if you know where the Kali is in the time cycle, then you also know like where you are in the time cycle, and so you could always find your way back at one. because it it adds like a third layer to this idea of rhythm that we have that it's just you know a vertical thing and i've always wondered correct me if i'm wrong but almost all of the different instrument traditions in india they have this reciting aspect to it do you know where that came from or why it is that way i'm not sure why it why it was never written down there's some talk maybe that they didn't want this getting in the hands of other people. I mean, this was serious business back in the day. So there were dowries that were given that were tabla compositions and some tabla guts and tukras, which we'll talk about later, but these fixed compositions weren't played in public for fear that someone would even grab that from hearing it. So that may be some part of it mm-hmm. as to why they, they kept it sort of an oral tradition. But that all changed with Bhaktandiji in the, I guess, mid to early 1900s. He sort of codified it and they found the notation system I mean, that's where your colleges i think in india started to come up because they could actually teach it because it was written down and notated hmm. so you talked about how different compositions were passed down as gifts and there's like different schools and they used to keep their compositions secret almost could you talk about the different schools of oh yeah so that's yeah india? that's a good nice dovetail so essentially the houses of tabla, which were called gharanas, they essentially started with one, the Delhi gharana. When you get into this area, there's speculation to when these, there's even speculation to when the instrument actually became the instrument. There's actually no really clear picture of tabla until like the mid 1700s. So anything before that, it could be a, a, a bunch of different drums they don't know. But they've, there's actually a picture, I think, of tabla with, you know, the black dots and everything in the mid-1700s. So with that being said, the first tabla garana was supposedly started in 1700. Mm. So this was called Delhi garana, which Delhi, these garanas, these schools, garana means uh, it's house. So your house is your, the people that are in your house, right? Your uh, sons and daughters and whoever else who's ever learning tabla. And for that matter, cousins. So the garana started with the Delhi garana and then the students of the person who started the Gharana and his kids, those students moved to different parts of India to seek employment. And when they did that, they took that talim, it's called, that knowledge, to other parts of India, then started their own thing. And just through being 
you know, amazing musicians in their own right, they start adding small things because they're not in that house anymore. They're, in, they're off on their own. And when you start adding to the repertoire and, and adding technique, then you get another garana. So this happened, essentially, there's six garanas that occurred this way, essentially, all having sort of slightly different takes on compositions, on technique. Then there's arguments on whether they're seven or eight. This is all stuff that's up for debate, basically. Mm -hmm. But, and like I said, when you get into this history part of it, it gets real dicey. Complex. When, yeah. Even if you interview some of the people from these garanas, they'll claim that it's a thousand years old, right? And we, we just don't know. Mm -hmm. essentially. And so which Garana have you studied most intensively? So there's also a word called parampara, which from what I understand is learning from a particular guru and his way of teaching. That's probably steeped in a, in a Garana, but it's also his contribution to that. I mostly studied Ustad Alaraka Kansab's parampara through Pandit Yogesh Samsi. Mm -hmm. So this is generally classified as Punjab. But before I learned from him, I had learned from someone in every Garana other than Punjab. A little bit here and there from all these different really good players in those Garanas. And is there a few characteristics of the Punjab Garana that make it the Punjab Garana? Sure. What so, and again, this is about the parampara of Ustad Alaraka Kasab. Mm -hmm. His contribution can never be spoken enough about to Punjab. So in learning his style, essentially, or, or I can't even say that I learned his style, but whatever I'm trying to achieve in this thing comes from that lineage. And this is these are, you can call, lagu-based compositions. This is one small aspect of what I think, sort of through my listening, think that he brought to the art. And again, far be it for me to even speak the man's name much less say what he brought to the art but from my humble knowledge of listening lagu i think is a south indian term that means microbeat mm -hmm. or small gap so a lot of abaji's compositions and pandit yogesh samsi's compositions have this aspect and this is what separates that parampara or you can say the gharana from other ones is that I'm going to start now what's called nagma or lehra. And that basically means melody that's played in whichever time cycle that you're playing your tabla solo in. Because that's what we're discussing now is tabla solo. Because there isn't an accompaniment aspect that we can get to later. But in tabla solo, there's usually a melodic instrument that's marking the time cycle, essentially for the audience. Because a tabla player should know where he's at within the tal when he's playing. He's not listening to that. These are lagu-based compositions, these first two. And then the third one that I'll play is the other contribution that I feel that he made to Punjab, and that is the cutting of the lay, we call it. So the actual rhythmic groupings, where it's essentially all going to be eighth notes. But the way that the language is chopped up within that 16 beats... It's just amazing. So the third one I'll play will be just a composition that's just the note values are the same. But it's hard to even think of that when you hear it. So here's the first two that are lagu based, means they have those micro beats in them. And I'll tell you about Tintal first. It's a 16 beat cycle we're playing in. And this melody is playing in that 16 beat cycle. And there's a particular set of notes that we play to mark this. Ta, din, din, ta, ta, din, din, ta, ta, din, din, ta, ta, din, din, ta. Ta, 
Anything that's not hitting on that, mm-hmm. on that beat, would be alagu. And if it's especially if it's a stress point. So that's the first one. Mm-hmm. So we'll also show later other gharana, this Delhi, I'll play a Delhi composition where you'll see that's different. Ginna, tati da gena, da gena, da gena, da gena. Another lagu based, as you can tell. Mm-hmm. So next one, this is just beautiful in the language and how it's just lays in there different with different access accent points. So in the Delhi composition that you'll play later, we'll be able to hear that it's a little bit more square than the one that you just played. Yeah, absolutely. See, nowadays, this is the thing. Everything's become so homogenized that anyone who's learned tabla for any amount of time, and mostly unknowingly or knowingly, they've brought in some of these things from other Quranas. Just through, I mean, music is all over. The tabla is all over now. So... You know, you're going to hear this kind of stuff maybe with players who aren't necessarily from the same tradition. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. But I'm speaking in general terms and uh, what I've seen, my view. So this is Delhi. Essentially, I'll play a famous Delhi composition now to the best of my ability. Um, and... One thing we didn't mention is that these are all just essentially bandishes, what I'm telling you. These are, these are themes of a poem, rhythmic poem, and they all get improvised upon. Um, so each one of those things I played would have whatever, you know, whatever your imagination can come up with. Um, firstly, you learn variations from your teacher, and then you sort of make your own. So this is Delhi. Another one from Delhi. Tati dhage na da tita kita da tit dhage tin na ke na da tit da ke na da tita kita da tit dhage tin na ke na da tit da ke na da tita kita da tit dhage tin na ke na da tit da ke na da tita kita da tit dhage tin na ke na. Thank you for tuning into today's episode, which is the first of our five-part series on the tabla. 
Today we introduce the basic sounds, pedagogy, and styles of tabla, and in the next episode we'll look at the basic theory and performance practice of Hindustani music. We'll also learn about the introductory section of a tabla solo, the peshkar, and we'll learn a bit about how to identify and follow along the progression of this composition. The material we cover can be complicated and unfamiliar, so for free comprehensive lessons on these subjects, which includes listenings and music transcriptions, check out our website, musicingpod.com, and follow us on social media, also at musicingpod. We hope to see you in the next episode.